All right, morning, you guys. How was the uh, how was the field trip? Any comments? Yeah. So we're picking. Up, I'm picking up quite a lot of background noise. So if you, please, please try not to move too much stuff down uh, on your desk. Probably the people that are sitting right underneath the mics. So was it fun? What anything special that uh, that you came away with it from? Any major revelations? Anything that was totally cool? Farming is very technological. Yeah, absolutely. It's surprisingly so, isn't it? Um, how how technological it is. It's uh, it takes a lot of different skills. Um, I think the place you see that most clearly is at the dairy. Right, where you see he's got to be a nutritionist and lucky he has a brother or brother-in-law that's an accountant. But yes, it's extremely technical. So all right, we're going to go ahead and this is actually our last lecture. It's a, it's a combination of things. I'm going to turn down the volume from your side because I'm getting a lot of feedback. Just hang on one second. And uh, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll mute it for now, and then we get to some questions in a moment. I'll go from there. Okay. So um, the last thing we need to talk about, one of the last things we want to talk about is organic farming, organic uh, trends. So one of the things that we've seen a lot of in society, I, I'd say at least in the last 10 years, is a lot of focus on organic. And I... And there's a lot of misinformation about organic um, and a lot of uh, misthinking, I guess, on, on organic. And so we're just going to quickly go into what's behind this trend, where is it going, and then um, hopefully from there, this is not a full lecture on the organic standards themselves, but just kind of some of the things we need to look, about, look forward to and think about if we're going to truly produce organic produce and people can rely on the fact that it is actually organic, okay? So, let's try to turn that on. There we go. All right. So, the sales of organic have climbed tremendously, okay, Th throughout the 90s. We've had increasing acreage. This is internationally and in the United States. And we've also... Um, Introduce federal regulations. There's the, the National Organic Program, the NOP, okay? And that's what most of the organizations that standardize. There's several uh, private or uh, nonprofits that actually standardize and sort of regulate and can come and inspect your farm to make sure, and your particular crop to make sure it's organic. I was just at a... Uh, on my, my seminar workshop that I went to last week, I was just at a pesticide testing facility, a lab that tests for pesticides. And it was extremely high tech. Um, and they can test for all sorts of pesticides very accurately. And most people, are, especially if you're organic, you're required to have your crop, send a sample of your crop, let's say it's broccoli, to that lab to get tested to make sure that you don't have haven't used those pesticides especially the federally regulated ones that you weren't supposed to use organic doesn't mean that you it'll never have any pesticides it just means that they will be limited and they'll especially be limit they'll, they'll be used properly and they'll especially be limited to ones that are federally approved okay so production is climbing um, this is just a look at um, the actual certified organic acres, 2.5 million. Doesn't necessarily mean a heck of a lot to me. I know that's a lot of acres, but you can see the climb there in the blue graph to the red graph. So you guys can actually see this now. Give me a thumbs up. You can actually see the PowerPoint this time. That is huge. We should go give a big cheer for that. Wow, that's cool. Thank you, Brian. All right, all right, so states, California leads the way. California has the highest, then Washington, then Wisconsin, then Minnesota. 
So we're not surprised again in California. Um, it, this has a lot to do with who the clientele is. We have people in California that A, can afford to and want to really look and think about what they're eating. And um, that's a little bit of a privilege, really. Not everyone gets to do that. A lot of people just get, but can buy what they can afford. Okay? The NOP is the law that governs the organic certification. Um, and they describe the specific re requirements that must be verified by USDA. So USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, by USDA accrediting certifying agent. That's what I'm talking about. It might be a, might be a company, it might be a nonprofit. They're certified by USDA to, 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 uh, to, to, to be, a, they're accredited by USA to certify that these crops are actually organic. The food is actually organic. Um, and this is all about protecting natural resources, conserving biodiversity, and using only approved substances, right? So organic, we sort of think of it about it, this catch-all, but it's really um, quite specific in, in what it's doing, okay? Organic crops, the USDA seal, so just as we talked, I think, earlier in the class, you'll actually get certified organic, and a seal, often stamped right on the bag or on the label saying this is USDA organically certified, and it verifies a few things. Irradiation. Irradiation is where we use high-frequency uh, high light to basically irradiate. Sounds terrible. Sounds like radiation. It's not radiation, but it's, it's, it's things like ultraviolet level light that you use to kill certain bacteria. So you actually, you actually shine ultraviolet, in some cases, onto the, onto the broccoli, for example, to kill off certain bacteria. So it can't be irradiated, can't use sewage sludge, can't use synthetic fertilizers, can't use prohibited pesticides. Okay, again, not no pesticides, but you can't use prohibited pesticides. And then the other thing that we should have picked up from Tim Hayes yesterday is that it, there's very careful and very specific ways that you can use that pesticide. You have to get approval for every pesticide you, you use. You have to actually put a little sign in the field that designates what pesticides being used and what's there at that moment to protect the public. It's very, very tightly controlled. People kind of have this idea that we can just go out and rent a uh, crop duster plane and go spray our fields whenever we like, and that's not true. Organic livestock. Okay, this is another area, mostly up to now we've been talking crops. Um, verifies that producers met animal health and welfare standards. Did not use antibiotics or growth hormones. Used 100% organic feed. That's really tough to actually do, by the way. There's so much feed comes from so many different sources. And they provided animals with access to the outdoors, okay? So... We have this lovely picture that organic, you know, the, and, and I'm, I'm laughing, just sort of a sarcastic laugh, because some of the things we ask for as a society aren't really possible. So you could do organic milk at that facility that we were at yesterday, right? At that dairy, those, that's a confined feeding operation, animals, the dairy cows are all on top of each other, but they have access to the outside. That doesn't mean that they're out grazing on a lush, beautiful green pasture. And that's kind of the image we have, let's say, if we're buying organic milk, right? Um, the other one I wanted to talk about that we got to look at yet is they did not use antibiotics, okay? So in this case, not only did we find out yesterday that he carefully segregates the animals that had, were treated for antibiotics, right? I wasn't there. I was, I was chatting with someone else about some other stuff when you guys went into the, the bulk holding room there the, where the big containers were to hold the milk. But I heard you guys talking about how very carefully controlled that even if a cow had to be given antibiotics for some kind of disease, it wasn't allowed, it, it was held or kept out of the, 
the supply chain, the milk's kept out of the supply chain long enough so that it doesn't contaminate the milk. There's a half-life of the antibiotic, and when the antibiotic wears off, then they can put that animal back in, into production. One thing here, guys, that is really important with this, there's two ways that antibiotics are used in animal production. One is to treat diseases and keep animals healthy. The other one is as a feed additive. Okay, and this is the one where there's legitimate controversy and a lot of concern. And I'm, I particularly think that this could stop immediately. So, for example, this is not used in things like dairy cows, but if you're raising chickens, broiler chickens are those ones that are raised for meat. If you go up onto Deep Creek here, turn right, go up go towards the San Bernardino Mountains. Not very far up on the left, there's a Zaki farm, chicken farm, that's raising broilers. And some of those folks, I'm not sure if Zaki farms, their ads say they don't, they actually put a low amount of antibiotics, a broad, uh, a broad uh, spectrum antibiotic, into the feed all, all the time. It's in the feed, at part of the feed formulation. And that's to keep the animals from getting any little bugs, any little stress from any disease-causing organisms, and they grow faster. It's actually used as a growth enhancement. It allows them to be healthy and grow faster. Well, problem with that is, is those are fed, and those antibiotics are there all the time. The bugs can get resistant to them, and that's what's causing some of our medicinal uh, health concerns in humans because we're getting certain uh, uh, staphylococcus, this new resistant staphylococcus uh, strain that they can't find antibiotics to treat and you can get in hospitals and die from even if you didn't go to the hospital for that reason, right? Um, and that's one of the big ways that these, these bacteria are getting resistant to it is because they're constantly exposed to it. Remember with antibiotics, your doctor should always only prescribe them for a very specific amount of time and then stop because then the, the, the bacteria don't have time to adapt to them, okay? So I just want to bring that up right now because this whole question of antibiotics in, in animals is two different ways. Of course, if an animal's sick, right? So mostly what would happen on that dairy, we would get a thing called mastitis, be an infection of the udder. And that's why they keep those udders so clean and so, so good. And that's actually one of the advantages of being in a confined feeding operation. They can actually keep them cleaner. If they're out on pasture, there's much more mud and much more debris and it's harder to do. So if you get mastitis, you have to treat that animal. It's actually the humane thing to do is treat that animal with antibiotics. But those are, treat, are totally different from the feed addi additive antibiotics, okay? So you guys get a feel for that. And that's what organic would prevent. You could not have any antibiotics used at all. So if your cow gets sick, you're not even supposed to use antibiotics on it at all. And quite frankly, I don't quite know how you would do that as organic farmer. I would still think you'd have to treat them with antibiotics because it's kind of the humane thing to do. You don't want them to literally die from that disease when it could be easily treated. So that's a kind of a push-shove thing. Okay, um, organic premiums, this is just showing that uh, you do get more per, per whatever, com, uh, per weight. So 550 as versus 2.45, $5.50 with 2.45 per, I forget the, the measure that they use for, for, uh, for grain on the commodities markets. Um, and so you can see you're getting just about double maybe a little bit more than double for organic. Um, so there is a price premium that would encourage you to go organic if that fit into your business model as a farmer. Dairy farmers pay price, the one in blue at the top here, that's what you, the farmer would get for organic milk, and this is what it would be the conventional price. As you can see, dropping, in, uh, especially in the conventional price, it, 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 it drops and, and lowers and raises quite drastically. There's quite a variation. And that's a big problem for dairy farmers. 
because their price margins, their profit margins are very small. And when these prices seesaw like this, it can put them in serious jeopardy. Okay? And uh, dairy farming in California over the last few years has had some really bad periods where the prices were actually at a point where they couldn't make a profit. And that's been a serious concern. So they're, they're definitely for something that's considered a basic staple, right? I think all societies uh, would say that milk is one of our basic staples that we should have. Um, who, who goes after this stuff? Who would buy organic? Well, older folks like me, college educated, married. What are the motivations? Personal health, I think that's legitimate. Food safety, we're gonna talk a little bit, hopefully at the end, about food safety. If you're assuming that if the food is organic, it's safer, um, I don't know. If you're not using pesticides and stuff like that and it's just grown more organically, there could be a better, bigger chance of some of the contaminating organisms like, uh, like salmonella to actually get into that product. But that's why people go there. Doesn't mean the food's safer, in terms of you getting sick from it, it might be your personal health. You feel like you're not eating pesticides or pesticide residues, and that's a good thing. And then concerns for the environment. Uh, organic is, is organic better for the, for the environment? Yes, I think it probably is. And then, of course, taste. People feel like organic would be different taste. It shouldn't taste any different. Where it would be different is they might use some of those heirloom varieties and organic farmer would think more along those lines. So they might use some of those heirloom uh, older varieties, for example, that have more taste, for example, um, or more nutrition. Okay, so that might just be bound up in that. Uh, where is it growing? In snacks, in seafood, in non-dairy beverages, in dairy, even in, in pet food. Okay, uh, barriers and concerns for organic uh, the organic industry, uh, lack of production information. So we don't really have enough information when we get the food. And, and most of this comes from um, the fact that we, a lot of this organic stuff can come from other countries. Okay, so you might buy organic tomatoes that are coming from Mexico. And what I found out this weekend that I didn't know before is really the onus goes on the wholesaler and the retailer to check for that. So it's really up to, to Stater Brothers to check that. So let's say Stater Brothers buys organic tomatoes from Mexico, okay? They bring it across the border. Most reputable places will have that tested. So they would take a sample of those tomatoes and send them to that lab. And they can get tests back in 24 hours. That lab runs 24 hours a day, and it'll tell them, hey, looking for certain pesticides. Because we might know that a certain substance, pesticide, is, is allowed in Mexico and isn't allowed here. So, a, so but it, it actually at the moment, the regulation of that, the onus, the responsibility is on the retailer and the wholesaler. So they were talking about how lots of little backyard people and farmers markets and those kinds of things they can't do that and they aren't doing that. And so you don't really know if it's really organic or not in terms of pesticides, in terms of sewerage sludge, in terms of synthetic fertilizers, any of that stuff, okay? Marketing information, consumer education, right? I think if you spoke to most people about organic, they would make the assumption that no pesticides were used. That's not true. So I think you need to know that, okay? Access to certified processes. So even if your, your, your product is um, organic, when it goes to process it, let's say into, into ketchup, the, the processor has to be certified organic as well, right? So they can't be adding any additives and preservatives that would make it not organic, okay? GMO contamination, okay? Are there, are there some GMO strains and seeds and, and uh, hybrids in there, basically? Okay. Price premiums, is there enough of a price premium? Can you make 
enough from that organic tomato to make it worthwhile to go through all of that as a producer. Remember, sustainability has to also be economic sustainability. Uh, farm program structure, setting up your farm to make sure that everybody knows what to do. And some old fellow like me that, that hasn't heard the latest rule doesn't just put on a pesticide back spray one day and go out and just spray the tomatoes because I know that's the way to kill that particular bug, right? So it's a whole structure. You have to put a whole structure into, into your production, onto your farm, okay? Attitude, familiarity, support, systemic. It needs to be a systemic change in the whole system. Everybody has to understand that. Availability of approved inputs, okay? So now we're not going to be able to use, uh, let's say, uh, pesticides, but we're going to use a natural uh, uh, pesticide or we're going to use, let's say, high concentration vinegar is one of the things they use to kill certain pests. Can we get it? Can we get these inputs we need to make our operation organic and at, and at a decent price? Okay, lack of organic research, especially in the livestock production. Okay, so that's research and education. Again, we're back to, we've got to have that component. Okay, uh, so basically just a little bit of information on people's perception. 46% uh, of the respondents believe the risk of contamination of the organic products by GMOs is moderate, high to very high. Because again, how do you really, really know? Let's say, let's say it's, it's organic beef and the person fed a grain to get them fat at the very end. They, how do they know that, that the grain or the wheat or the, or the bran or cotton seed hulls like you saw yesterday didn't come from an inorganic, not an inorganic source, but a source that wasn't organic, okay, certified organic, or didn't have, GM, in this case, didn't have GMOs, okay? Um, so I think that's enough on that. Is an adequate framework in place to protect armor, organic farmers from GMO contamination? I'm not an expert on it, but I doubt it because we're having enough trouble just proving that things are organic in the first place. Okay? Protecting organic standards, right? Um, how do we, how do, these are some of the key things. We, need, we have to get, reach this 100% organic feed for livestock. Okay? Like I said, that's hard to do. No antibiotics, no feeding of slaughter byproducts. Okay? So this is an interesting one. Um, What's a slaughter byproduct? Well, you've probably seen it. If you really look even in your dog food, you'll see things like bone meal. Okay, So after they slaughter the animal, they take those bones and they grind them up because that's a great source of calcium and phosphate. Okay, Things like that. Um, in, the, in aquaculture, how do we make sure that uh, it's, it's, they're organic? And, uh, and a wild fish just necessarily organic based on what they're eating, okay? Um, appropriations, uh, research, accreditation, all those kinds of things. Okay, resources. So those are some resources. I don't know if any of you are doing your uh, research on organic. Is anyone doing organic? Put a hand up if you do. I turned you guys off for a moment because of the back feed. Okay. All right. So real quick, a couple other things. We're going to go through them uh, Nice and quickly, you guys are done uh, fairly soon today, so I'm not going to, I know we've only got a shorter amount of time. But one of the things that's a sustainable practice is a thing called farmscaping. So landscaping, as it were, on the farm. And we've talked about this a little bit before, but I just wanted to talk about it more. It's also often called hedgerows, even though on strictly hedges. But basically that's taking the edges or the parts of the farm that aren't being used and putting them into native plants, right? And it was interesting, you guys remember when we stood over at the pistachio orchard yesterday? Um, we didn't really see any of that. That's one thing that struck me about yesterday, is it was all kind of cleared. Well, that's okay for weeds and all of that, but we did learn that pistachios need wind pollination and insect pollination. So if we develop a hedgerow, a natural border, here's actually erosion 
place where they've allowed some native plants to grow. Well, these are places where we can have habitat for native bees, for example. Okay? Um, and so there's a lot of reasons to have also beneficial insects, wasps and things that might, might attack and eat the, whatever the pests are on that particular crop. Okay? So what are the reasons for doing this native landscaping around our fields on our farm? Uh, it's beneficial for insect and pollinator habitat, wildlife habitat. Okay, all right. So, you know, they talked about gophers, right, uh, yesterday. What a big problem they were. Well, what about ground squirrels? So what if we wanted one of our little desert foxes to have a place to live in this little, in this little habitat we produce? So it can eat some of those ground squirrels. Because ground squirrels, when they were talking gophers, they were actually talking both. They were talking gopher gophers, like underground. They were also talking ground squirrels. A huge problem in local agriculture. So why don't, you know, coyotes. Why couldn't we have a nice little habitat on our farm for coyotes so that they, they could eat, uh, eat those kinds of, uh, of pests on the farm, okay? Um, of course, you, then you can't, you can't have a little... One of those little fluffy dogs. You've got to have a real dog if you if you live there. You can't have fluffy because fluffy's probably also going to be bait at that point, right? So soil erosion control, planting stuff, roots. Obviously, that's what protects from wind and water erosion. Weed control. These guys will take over and they will prevent weed from from growing up. We have a huge problem with that locally. Not necessarily, I'm not now talking farms, but I'm talking in, on houses. The local fire department wants you to come in and clear everything. Well, they're making a big mistake, and that's actually not, it's actually illegal in, for them to ask you to do that in the sense that there's, there's uh, clearing uh, ordinances where you're not allowed to clear the land unless you actually have a grading permit. It's not enforced, but the county could come by and, and fine you for that. What we want people to do is go in and take out the weeds and leave the native plants. Over time, if you do that and you don't disturb everything, things like tumbleweeds will actually go away. It's hard to believe, but they'll actually go away. But if you scrape and drag like most people do in the desert, the land, then tumbleweeds will come back year after year. Okay? Non-point source water pollution. Okay? So that means you've got water pollution pesticide runoff coming from the whole field. If it goes through one of these habitats, it'll be, be controlled and not allowed to go off into the surface water, the groundwater. They form barriers. They can literally be a barrier for certain kinds of animals. If you go to Mexico, they'll actually take uh, choya and certain kinds of yuccas. They'll actually build fences out of it to make a barrier. Well, that's, that's a form of, 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 of farmscaping. Okay, riparian stabilization, that's in, in wet areas, in river areas. Windbreaks are huge. Here at the college, we used to sell windbreak trees so that we can break that, the wind. We, if you were there for Tim talking about why they planted grass between the pistachios, that was to prevent wind erosion. Well, you can also literally put windbreaks up along that road we came in. If you put a windbreak up there, it would greatly reduce the the amount of uh, soil erosion. And also, um, then, I also provide a much better habitat for those trees. They wouldn't have so much wind drying them up and, and blowing their, uh, their, their blossoms off. For one of the big problems with pistachios in the desert is if we get a big wind event when they flowered, we can actually have them totally blow the, the, the pollen and, and, actually, and actually damage the flowers before they can be pollinated. Okay? Aesthetic value, it looks really good. Economic returns, the farmers that have done this in the San Joaquin Valley, um, for example, I've been to a couple, they say, for example, I'm an almond grower. I don't have to spend nearly as much money now getting native bees brought to, I mean, domestic bees brought to my farm. I can go and have these hedgerows. We're going to see uh, Mr. Anderson on a slide in a moment. They don't have to spend as much on that anymore, so it actually is economically viable as well. Increase local and regional biodiversity. That's pretty obvious. 
So here's a, a look at that. That's, this is a road with, with a nat native hedgerow actually on both sides. There's another one. There's another one. There's actually uh, Anderson, John Anderson holding a gopher snake. Again, gophers. Think about gopher snakes in terms of those of those gophers and, and even other little critters that you don't want on your land. You want these guys to be around. All kinds of rodents. Okay? Insects on flowers. Again, those, some of those could be beneficial insects, right? Those could be ladybirds that are eating aphids. Okay? Converting a roading ditch into a grassed waterway, obviously that's going to slow down the water. It's going to keep more of the water on the land, which is good for the land. Also going to keep the, 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 uh, the flood runoff, the runoff of pesticides and extra fertilizers off the farm, which now is becoming highly controlled. Okay, you can't do that. Okay, en energy inputs into food production. We're going to go through this really quickly. Um, we all know that all the energy that we use in our system here on Earth comes from the sun, ultimately, right? Other than fossil fuels, right? Um, but if we really look at that, we need to look at, if we're going to be sustainable, we need to look at the additional energy. And some of this is cultural energy, ideas, hard work, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so you guys are done. We'll keep going on those uh, on your final reports and also we working on the final okay I'm I probably will get to grading yours tomorrow morning early this class so look for your grades look and I'll be giving you ideas on how you can improve things all right thanks you guys all right so energy is really important but the only point we really want to make here is it comes from also cultural energy right um, and then the energy that we don't think of that it requires to produce the machines, the tools, the seed, the fertilizer in the first place. We just tend to think of on the farm, it's the energy we're using right on the farm, right, for our gasoline or whatever. Okay? So we must examine all these energy inputs to understand the energy costs of agriculture and develop a basis for, a more, for more sustainable use of energy in agriculture. Okay? So here's a little little uh, diagram of where they come from. If we look over here on the left, this is the ecological energy, solar energy, which would be through photosynthesis, but it also could be uh, from, from solar panels. Cultural energy, energy supplied by humans to optimize and production of biomass, food in this case. Biological cultural energy come from human and animal sources, and then industrial cultural energy, okay? So this is the stuff we have to put in, like electricity, gasoline, diesel, natural gas. We need to balance all of this, okay? And strategies, I think we can go in a few of these. How do we preserve energy in the system, conserve and manage it better? We can use greater use of nitrogen-fixing crops like alfalfa. They're more productive. They provide more food. Uh, we can use, use better use of biological pest management, integrated pest management. Introduce crops that are appropriate and adapt to the local environment so we don't have to spend as much on pesticides and fertilizers and everything. We can do the windbreaks and hedgerows and we can basically mimic the local ecosystems as much as possible. Thank you very much.